Hi, everyone. I'm Uriel Finkel, and on behalf of the ASG, we welcome you to our ATTR amyloidosis treatment and trial webinar. Our previous webinars can be viewed on our webinar section of our website, amyloidosissupport.org, and on our YouTube channel. This webinar should be up there in a few weeks. The response to our webinars has been really overwhelming. And so we will be continuing them along with the resumption of our face-to-face in-person meetings. Speaking of which, Paula has a Baltimore Hopkins meeting coming up next Saturday with over 150 registered. And we have about 100 registered for our March 23rd Mayo Phoenix meeting. We also have meetings in Kansas City, Philadelphia, Portland, and San Diego planned for April. Information on all our meetings can be found on our website, and we regularly promote them on our private Facebook groups as well. We do thank you if you mailed in some questions. We'll get them answered today, and also you'll be able to type in questions for the Q&A as well. Our presenters today are Dr. Tony Yuri from UCSD, Dr. Shafiq Karam from the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Jonathan Wall from the University of Tennessee will be joining us to talk about a new study. And we'll be joined by our pharma friends. From El Nylon, we'll have Gabriela Temeriz, Bridge Bios, Adam Castaño, and Hannah Pope. Intellius Lyron Walsh. Novo Nordisk, Dr. Gamberg Mueller. AstraZeneca's Alyssa Perenko, Alexion's Dr. Christina Cuarta, and Pfizer's Lori Baylor. Jam-packed meeting today, right? Dr. Farouk Sheikh was originally scheduled to be here as well, but he had a family medical issue come up, and we do wish him and his family well. There will be a quick survey when this meeting is over, and we do ask that you please take the time to fill it out. Should you have to leave early, we ask that you fill it out when you leave. It's important to us and it helps us develop future webinars. You won't be able to post comments in the chat, but please do check it out periodically as Paula will be posting links and other information there. Paula will let you know how to save the chat for future reference. And speaking of Paula, in the control room today, we have ASG's executive director, Paula Schmidt. Welcome everybody. And our special projects director, Bob Gibson. Hello, everybody. We'll be working off our treatment chart today. And Paula will be putting a link for it in the chat. You can feel free to email me at muriel at amyloidosissupport.org for a copy so you don't have to wonder how to spell any of the treatments we talk about today. And now, to give us an overview of current approved FDA treatments for ATTRCM is Dr. Tony Yuri. Dr. Yuri. Good morning and thank you for the invite. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be going over FDA approved uh, therapies and also I'm gonna cover in this section uh, therapies that should be approved that we anticipate will get approval later on this year. And just to remind everyone, uh, because I will be referencing this later on throughout the talk, um, this is a depiction of how amyloid develops. This is for transthyretin amyloid. And just as a reminder for those that haven't gone through this, um, it originates in the liver. Most of this protein, which I'm going to call TTR, is made in the liver. Um, and the liver produces this protein that I'm gonna also refer to as a, as a four leaf clover. So a protein that will circulate in the blood, um, it becomes a problem and leads to amyloid when it starts to break up into uh, single units. And then these single units will then misfold, uh, fold incorrectly, and then start to stick together forming amyloid. Amyloid then can get, get uh, infiltrate tissue or get inside of tissue and then cause dysfunction of that organ. Um, and we'll hear a little bit about heart and also uh, how it affects the nerves later on. For the initial talk, I'm going to focus on stabilizers. 
Um, and you'll see that that's shown in blue. Uh, I'm going to talk about tefamidus and acoramidus, and, and I'll uh, just, I mentioned diflunisil there because it is an off-label uh, medication that is available, um, and I'm not really going to focus on that one for today's talk. So I, I think it's important to recognize in the clinical trial with tefamidus who was enrolled, and why that's key is because as we go throughout the day talking about the different trials, you'll notice that um, a lot of the criteria to get inside the trials uh, has changed. So for this trial called ATTRACT, patients were uh, between the ages of 18 to 90 years. They had to have amyloid identified by biopsy. So recall, this is an older era when we did not have the nuclear imaging studies available. The echocardiogram or the ultrasound of the heart had to look like amyloid. And then you had to have some form of heart failure, whether you were hospitalized for heart failure or needed some uh, diuretics to get fluid off that was required. And then lab criteria, you had to have an NT pro BNP, which I think many, many people will ask about that later on, of greater than 600. Some of the, the reasons why you would not be a candidate for the trial would be if you had heart failure from other causes, not amyloid related. If you had very, very advanced disease, um, different forms of amyloid, or if you had really advanced kidney disease or had received a heart or liver transplant. So let's talk about how tefamidus works. This is a depiction that I, I, I think shows nicely where tefamidus really plays its role in stopping or, or halting this progression of this disease. So again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call the protein TTR a four-leaf clover and that's the most stable state that we want to keep in the body that does not lead to amyloid. So tefamidus will bind where a protein called thyroxine typically binds. And the way I think about it, it locks it in a very stable state uh, that doesn't lead to amyloid fibril formation. Um, so by doing so, you remove uh, the, the precursor, so to speak, or the protein uh, that will eventually lead to amyloid formation, and that will go into the heart. Importantly, it works on the circulating TTR, the one that's in the bloodstream. So it does not necessarily impact, the, it doesn't impact the TTR or the amyloid that's already deposited in the heart, in the other organs, in the carpal tunnel, et cetera. But it slows down and hopefully halts progression by not allowing more TTR to break up and lead to amyloid formation. Why did this, this medication get approved? And I'm, I'm gonna go over a little bit of the data and I'll explain some of the, the tables and figures I'm showing. But uh, we looked at death in the ATTRACT trial and we saw that patients that were on tefamidus, which is the blue line versus the placebo, the sugar pill, the red line, we're more likely to survive. So we wanna see separation of the two curves over time. And you'll see that around month 18, there's a, a separation where more patients on the tefamidus arm survived compared to placebo. Of course, that's a, a very important outcome. We wanna make, make sure that medications will help us live longer, feel better. Uh, and of course, living longer is a very important outcome to look at. What about hospitalization? Similarly to the benefit we saw in death, those that were on tefamidus were, were less likely to be hospitalized. So um, if you look at the actual publication, you'll see that the outcomes, it was a complicated outcome for me to describe in this, uh, in this chat or in this discussion, but I do wanna highlight that in terms of time to hospitalization, tefamidus did better than placebo. We also look at, and I'll submit to you that many patients come to me that have amyloid and they ask me, not only will I live longer, but will I feel better? So a very important uh, thing to look at is how do patients fare uh, in terms of their quality of life and their ability to function? And um, I'm gonna uh, ask you to look at the panel on the left first, and you'll see this is the change in how far they could walk in six minutes. So the six minute walk test, as we call it, and those on tefamidus over time were able to walk a longer distance if they were on tefamidus compared to placebo. Um, so that's again, very important for us to look at. Patients still over time do lose some ability to walk a longer distance. Uh, that's probably related to just aging also. 
Um, but we see that there is a benefit with tefamidus. And then I want to move you over to the one on the right. This is KCCQ. It's a scale that's often used in uh, cardiology trials. Basically, you can think about it as quality of life questionnaire. And there's multiple questions patients are asked at the beginning of the trial and throughout the trial period. And, it, and we compare it and look at how does their quality of life change over the uh, 30 months in the trial. And as you can see here, those that aren't a feminist, again, the blue line, had um, less change in their quality of life. It did slightly get worse over time, but not as bad as if they were on the placebo, where you saw uh, a, a more rapid worsening of their quality of life. So what are important considerations? Two doses were studied uh, in this trial, 20 milligrams once a day, and then 80 milligrams, or four, four tablets of the 20 milligrams. Um, the, uh, the outcomes were looked at together, both doses, but the FDA eventually approved the 80 milligram dose. And in terms of what, what that translates to, the trade name is Vindakil, 80 milligrams, or 40, four, uh, mil, four tablets of the 20 milligrams. And that's the same as Vindamax. So sometimes patients will say, why are you switching me from one to the other? It often may be related to payers or insurance is what they'll cover, but the, the 80 milligrams is the 60 milligram equivalent. Um, and the safety profile was equal between tefamidus and placebo. Um, so essentially we don't have any side effects that we report that we're seeing more, more often in the tefamidus arm. Now, I, I mentioned to you that I also wanted to discuss acaramidus and I want, want to be very clear. This is not FDA approved currently. And the reason why I share it after tefamidus is because I think about them in a similar fashion. Um, so I, I want to point out a few differences in the trials because I think many, if it does get FDA approved as we expect, many will ask, what about tefamidus versus acaramidus? And, and I think it's important to recognize what are the differences in the trials as you and your physicians will make a decision on what's the appropriate therapy. So I've highlighted in red the major differences in the trials. One is that it was a newer era. It was years after the Tefamidus trial. Um, so you, we also had the nuclear scan, and I'm, I'm sure many have gotten this pyrophosphate scan. Uh, so that was available to be enrolled in the trial. You no longer had to have a biopsy. And then in terms of the lab criteria, uh, the nt BNP cutoff was 300. So you can imagine if nt BNP gets increases with worsening disease, if you have a lower cutoff, it's a healthier population or a less, less affected population. I think this will come back later on when I discuss some of the outcomes. So how does acaramidus work? So again, think about the four-leaf clover. Uh, that's the most stable form of TTR that does not lead to amyloid uh, deposition. And acaramidus, also known as AG10, uh, will also stabilize and it binds uh, the four-leaf clover and locks it also in this uh, stable four-leaf clover state, avoiding the pathway that leads to amyloid production. And I'm not going to go over the exact mechanism on why it differs from tefamidus, but it essentially will give you a similar, what we call stabilization of this protein. Um, similar to tefaminus, I want to show some of the comparison data. Now, this is kind of flipped over. If you recall tefaminus, I showed it going in a different direction. Uh, but in terms of death, we also want to see separation. Um, and you'll see at least visually, the blue line is placebo. The, the I guess the golden color uh, line is acaramidus. And you want to see separation of the two. And towards the 30 months, you do start seeing separation. Um, for those that have reviewed the actual paper, you'll note that this alone was not statistically significant. It didn't meet the, the requirement to be called statistically significant. That being said, it was trending in that direction and was very, very, uh, just mildly missed that cutoff. Um, and, and I think there's going to be reasons why we'll discuss later on why that's the case. Um, in terms of does it work in, with NT pro BNP levels. So I've already alluded to that being one of the criteria to enter the trial. And I'll also just mention that NT pro BNP, which is a blood test that we can check for, um, does go up with worsening or more advanced disease. 
So it is one that we could potentially track over time. And you'll see that acaramidus increased, but not as severely as those on placebo, where you saw a more uh, dramatic increase. So it does seem that it's slowed progression when compared to placebo. If you do check an anti and PU, ideally uh, want it to go down or stay stable. In terms of six minute walk distance, similarly to what I mentioned with tefamidus, um, there was an improvement when you were on acaramidus, but you didn't see that improvement or that benefit until about 18 months. So there was stabilization or there was no real change the first 18 months, then you saw that. Um, I'm gonna also show Kansas City, the questionnaire, the quality of life. And I'll just mention that again, similar to Tefamidus, you had improvement on acaramidus and that separation was seen fairly quickly after they enrolled in the trial versus the placebo. Um, again, this is a questionnaire that we look at to track over time what the quality of life is for that patient. And does it work? So imagine if you're checking a TTR level, you're checking the four leaf clover, um, you would ideally want to see that level go up or, or um, not decrease like you see here. So you'll see that in the placebo arm, there was no real change in the TTR level. It stayed fairly stable. In acaramidus, you saw that it would increase. And the reason it increases is because you now have less of the that four-leaf clover breaking up into the single units that lead to amyloid. One dose, one, one dose was studied 800 twice a day. And we anticipate the FDA will make uh, a decision by the end of November. So in end of 2024, we'll have an update on whether this therapy is approved or not. The safety profile, similar to tefamidus, um, in acaramidus was, was essentially the same. And serious side effects were more likely in the placebo group. So the question I think many will ask at the end of the year or maybe in 20, early 25 is, should we compare the two? And I, I, I highlighted early on the inclusion criteria where I mentioned that in acaramidus, we had a cutoff of 300 for the NT pro BNP. I also mentioned that we could now avoid a biopsy. But I also want to just remind everyone that these were not done at the same period. They were done after uh, many folks became quote unquote amyloid experts, and there was more interest in this condition. So our management has changed quite significantly over the last 20 years for amyloid. Um, and the way I interpret the data is that the tefamidus group was a sicker group than acaramidus. So the outcomes cannot be compared. It was not a comparison trial. And it, if you just look at the six minute walk distance, you'll see that the patients in acaramidus actually fared quite well, even in the placebo arm compared to the treatment arm. And again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting comparing the data, but I want to compare the differences. And this is why I really would advise not comparing the two. And in terms of death, in the placebo arm, so if you imagine patients who did not receive any treatment at 30 months into famitis arm, the death was 43%, acaramidus 25%. Again, highlighting that these are two different populations we shouldn't be comparing. And the way I would think about it is that they're both options um, for this condition. I would advise you to discuss with your physician on what's the appropriate therapy. So what uh, important considerations with these two drugs, tefamidus and acaramidus, they don't reverse amyloid. So the idea that you're going to start tefamidus or acaramidus and feel a whole lot better is one that I, I try to ensure my patients don't have that mindset. Um, because it's going to slow progression down and you have evidence that shows it slows it down. It doesn't reverse it or doesn't necessarily uh, improve the amyloid burden. What are some of the common questions that I get? How do I know if tefamidus, and this will also apply to acaramidus in the future. How do I know if it's working? What labs can I check? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a good way to check that um, because we don't have a way of measuring easily TTR that's circulating in the blood, or I'm sorry, fibrils that are circulating in the blood. We also don't have a way to say, well, if you were, if, if your, let's say your NT pro BNP is going up, does that mean it's not working? Not necessarily. You saw that in the acaramidus trial, even those that were on treatment, that NT pro BNP went up. And that also applies to tefamidus. So 
we don't we, we can't follow that what about imaging does that help us also not necessarily um so getting more pyrophosphate scans nuclear scans echo mris although we sometimes do it um there's no clear criteria or definition of what is known to be a tefamidus responder and one who's not responding to tefamidus. And I think there was a question on, do I need to take tefamidus for, for the rest of my life? Um, well, the short answer is, you, you sh if you have no side effects and you, you're on tefamidus, you would take it for as long as you could. Obviously, with new clinical trials and new therapies becoming available, that may change in the lifetime. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll end my section and pass it on to uh, Muriel and Dr. Karam. Thank, thank you so much. That, that was so helpful, the way you compared the two, but not explaining that you really can't compare the two, but one being a thicker group when they started the trial. That, that, that's really important for us to learn. And, and also, you know, we get that question so much, how do I know if it's working? And I'm sure that question will be popping up again. We don't have anything typed in the Q&A yet about that, but um, I'm sure we will. Okay, so next uh, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Karam, and he's going to fill us in on some uh, ATTR with polyneuropathy. So Dr. Karam, take it away. Yeah, hi, Muriel, and uh, thank you, Dr. Uri, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, and thank you all for being here on a Saturday afternoon. It's uh, uh, good to see uh, such a good turnout. So I will be discussing the HETTR neuropathy treatments. Um, so um, I'm an associate professor of neurology at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have been working on amyloidosis for over 10 years. So just a, a short summary, you've, you've seen this before, but I think it's always good to show it when, we, when we're discussing treatment. Neutrestyretin is this protein that is produced mainly by the liver, but other organs also produce it. But most of the circulating uh, TTR in the blood is coming from the uh, uh, liver. So that makes it an attractive target. Actually, the first treatment back in the 90s were liver transplant, a uh, healthy liver transplant in these patients. Now remember, the liver itself is healthy, but the protein that secreted the transthyretin uh, is prone to uh, dissociate and become amyloidosis. Now other areas that make this protein as well are the uh, choroid plexus in the brain. So you do have some production in the brain, and this is important because a lot of our treatment right now are targeting the liver, but not the brain. And then you also have amyloidosis production by the eye. And that's why some people develop floaters, glaucoma, cataract, etc. So that's another uh, area where some of my patients suffer and it's hard to treat that as well. You've seen this picture. Uh, this is how the protein is made by the liver. Uh, if, if some of you remember the biology class, you have the DNA, which codes for the protein and codes for everything that we make in our body. Um, and you have the RNA that actually uh, is translated into the protein. So the RNA is another target for this protein or the protein itself or removing it. So people with neuropathy or HATTR in general, how do we treat them? There's two main arms. We focus on the symptoms, meaning if people are having lightheadedness when standing up, their blood pressure is dropping, we treat that. If they're having a lot of diarrhea, we treat this. Uh, erectile dysfunction, etc. But we also have to treat the root cause of the disease. And this is the specific TTR uh, treatment. So for today's talk, I was asked to specifically focus on the TTR treatment rather than on the symptoms. So you've seen this picture before, we can target the liver, we can target the TTR protein once it's already secreted in the blood. And there are some research targeting the TTR once <clears throat> excuse me, the amyloid once it deposits in the organs, and these are with the antibodies. So what is approved right now uh, by the FDA for the treatment of peripheral neuropathy? So as of, what is today, March 9, 2024, we have four treatment approved by the FDA for peripheral neuropathy. So you've got the Petisiran or Onpatro, Inotercin or Texeri, Vitrisiran or Amphutra, and the most recent one, Eplotercin, or why new you are. Now, we have medication that do work on the neuropathy, but they're not approved by the FDA for the polyneuropathy. 
uh, tafamidus, we just talked about this uh, with Dr. Ure, and diflunizol, which is another stabilizer, but it has anti-inflammatory uh, effect, and uh, it's used off-label, basically, but it's widely available and it's very cheap. So I'm a big fan of diflunizol, if you don't have contraindication, obviously. And the good news is that there's also a lot of interest in this disease, uh, despite the fact that it's very rare. We have a lot of companies that are investing and researching, and we will uh, maybe talk very briefly about those. So this is a table that shows us the different medications that are currently available in the United States. As you recall, the tefamidus and daflunisol are not approved by the FDA for neuropathy. Uh, but the other four are approved, and I put them here so you can see the difference between them. So patisiran and the novel version of patisiran, which is patisiran, both target the RNA uh, with a small interfering molecule, and inotercin target also the RNA, but they are antisense oligonucleotide. So slightly different mechanism of action, but the effect is basically the same. They reduce the trans protein in the blood. So they tell the liver, hey, liver, stop making that much TTR because that could turn into amyloid and it reduces the production anywhere between 70 to 80%, depending on the drug. Uh, what are the side effects with these medication? With the novel one, meaning vitriciran and opletercin, there's not a lot of side effects. There's some pain, uh, infusion site reaction, injection site reaction, etc. With patisiran, it was a bigger deal because it's an IV drug and it's given every three months, three weeks, and it has to be pre-medicated. So people would go on steroids, um, antihistamine, uh, anti-acid prior to the infusion, and they have to have a line and the infusion go for an hour. Inotercin, which with Texati, is a once a week injection under the skin. So it's very convenient. The patient does it themselves. The problem is that it can potentially drop the platelet, which will lead to uh, potentially bleeding. And bleeding can be serious, especially if it happens in the brain. Um, there's also some other uh, side effects like nausea and vomiting. And with the novel version, eplotercin, which is once a month uh, and also administered by the patient, we don't have these concerns. So we don't have to monitor the platelet count, the kidney function, the liver function, et cetera. Same thing with vitriciran, it's a subcutaneous, it's every three months, so less frequent, and we don't have to pre-medicate people, and we don't have to give any medication with it or, or monitor blood tests, um, but it does have to be given by a healthcare professional, either at home or at a clinic or a hospital, etc. So it's always good to know what we're talking about. We talk about Amvutra, but it's nice to see it, I think. So that's why I put this picture of the drug here. So again, Amvutra is the drug that is given every three months and it's administered by a healthcare provider. So remember that. So it's less frequent, but you have to have somebody uh, administered to you. And you can see it's a small needle. It goes under the skin here in the belly, arms or thighs. And uh, you inject it at a 45 degree angle and it's pretty quick and you're all set. This is uh, the Wainua, which is uh, the self-administered, but once every month. Um, and you can also do it in your belly or thighs. And if somebody's doing it for you, like uh, some, a family member or friend, then you can do it in the back of the upper arm. Uh, this one, you give it at a 90 degree angle, you push it, it's an auto injector. So you don't have to press anything. You just push it in the skin. The needles goes in, deliver the drugs, and then you remove it and you, you dispose of it. So what do these drugs do? They target the liver. So they target the RNA protein uh, that is being translated into transthyretin, and they drop the level of the TTR protein. And the TTR protein is the precursor for eventually the amyloidosis. So if you reduce the precursor, you, in theory, can reduce the amyloid deposition. And this has been proven in clinical trial that it does work. So if you are able to improve, uh, reduce the TTR protein, um, you are able to um, reduce the amount of amyloid and uh, slow down or even stop the progression of the disease. Now, one thing that is a little bit confusing, the stabilizers actually increase the level of the TTR protein. So if you have a patient who's taking just the, TTR, the stabilizer and you measure the TTR and it goes up, that's a good thing. 
if you have a patient that is on silencer or meaning on uh, Ambutra or uh, Eplotersin and the TTR goes down, that's a good thing. I think it's a little bit confusing if people are on both because you can still have some TTR, pro, you know, you can detect it in the blood and then you're not sure what to make of it. So keep that in mind. If somebody's obsessing about the TTR protein or the pre-albumin, that's how we check it in the in the laboratory. Um, just keep that in mind. So again, we said, let's reduce the TTR. Does that work? And the answer is yes. Um, it actually works really well, reducing the TTR protein. And you can see here on the left, I have the trial with the uh, patisiran. And on the right, I have the trial with the inotersin. And the what we're measuring here is the MNIST plus 7 and the Norfolk quality of life. So the MNIST plus 7, uh, just to make it very simple, is when the, when the physician pushes on your arm, pushes on your fingers, pushes on your feet, and, and grade a score to tell you how, how strong you are, check the reflexes, and check your sensation. So all of that is calculated into a score. And the higher the score goes up, the worse the neuropathy is. And if it's zero, then the neuropathy is good. So if you look at the patisserine arm here, the NIS dropped by five points, uh, whereas uh, the placebo arm went up by 28 points. So that's a, a significant uh, improvement with this drug. Uh, same thing for the quality of life. Uh, these are questions regarding the symptoms of the patient, the pain, the, the activity of daily living, sleep, et cetera. And again, it goes down, which is a good thing with Petisiran, and it goes up uh, with the uh, Norfolk. So really a dramatic uh, effect. I mean, this is a, a great drug, in my opinion. Um, in a tercin, kind of similar things. You have stability in that case, not improvement of the neuropathy on the MNIST plus 7 and on the Norfolk. And these are the, the side effects. So for the patisserine, they're not really that serious. We do have to prevent the side effects by giving people medication. So that's one of the issues. Uh, not a big deal. I mean, a lot of time I was able to taper down the steroids and even stop the steroids in, in many of my patients. Um, but with inotersin, there was the, the serious uh, side effects of uh, thrombocytopenia, which can lead to bleeding and glomerulonephritis, etc. So with that, you have to register in a REMS program. You have to enter the uh, the patient the numbers, and you have to monitor every week the blood uh, to to make sure that. The, so it was a little bit inconvenient. So that works short term. Look at this trial; they're eighteen months and seven less than seventy weeks. So about a year and a half, let's say. Uh, but this is a chronic condition, and you have to continue treatment. Unfortunately, unless we find a cure, there's not a lot of ways around it. We have to continue with the treatment. We don't. We just don't stop it. It's not like an infection. You take antibiotic, and you're fine. This is unfortunately a long, a long-term condition. Um, so, does the drug lose effect and benefit over the long term? Uh, so, so far, it doesn't look like it. Look at this. Is the TTR again? It drops, and this is. Um, a, a longer time for over two years of the study. Um, this is with inotersin. And we see the same thing with the uh, patisserine as well. So following people over 30 months, so over two years, two and a half years and 156 weeks, you see that really impressive, that neuropathy is stable, something that you don't see in amyloidosis. The amyloidosis, HATTR, the neuropathy keep getting worse Every month, every month, neuropathy keeps working. But with these drugs, the neuropathy is really stable. The quality of life is stable. Really great outcome. Now, one thing I want to point out, you see the placebo group, which on the left is on the, in the red and blue on the right, just to make things a little bit confusing. I apologize about that. Um, but people who are not treated, meaning they were on placebo, unfortunately, once you put them on treatment, while well, they are stable, but what they have lost is lost. So meaning that if you have nerve damage, unfortunately, a lot of time it doesn't really get better. And this is why we're always obsessed and concerned. We really want to diagnose people early before they have extensive nerve damage. Uh, so we get to the get to the bottom part and not to the upper part of these pictures here. Now, MNIST is great, Norfolk is great, but what about 
do you improve, do you get better, or do you, or do you stay the same, or do you get worse? And this study specifically looked at that, again, long-term, over two years, and you can see that about 50% about of patients are the same, you know, so they don't really progress. Great, great news. 25% worsen and 10% uh, get better. Now, there's some missing data, so that's why it doesn't add up to 100%. But that's what I tell people when they start on the on the treatment. You know, we don't want to overpromise anything that happens that is positive. That's great, but I tell them, you know, what we're trying to do with these drugs is to slow down the progression, hopefully halt it. Uh, and it would be amazing if we can improve anything. But realistically, let's focus on really dramatically slowing down to the point of slowing down the disease. So that's where we are at right now. Obviously, again, the earlier you start the treatment, the much better the outcome. In that case, you can really stabilize it and maybe improve a little bit. So these drugs were great, patisiran and inotercin, but they had some drawback, right? With the patisiran, it's an IV drug. Every three weeks, you have to premedicate. With inotercin, it's a subcutaneous, great. Once a week, patient does it themselves, but the, you have to also check the blood every week, so that's a pain. So the companies came up with uh, kind of version two or, uh, you know, I call it the revenge of these drugs. So Vitriciran or Ambutra and Eplotercin or Wenua are the new drugs. And in the last year, I only have a few patients left on, on Patro, really just a handful. But most of my patients are on, uh, now switch to Vitriciran. And now people are also choosing Wainua because they do it themselves once a month. So do these drugs work? And they were compared to basically um, the old study. So they, were, they weren't, at this point, it's hard to do a double blind placebo control. You, you cannot, once you have drugs that work, you cannot really do placebo. It's unethical. Um, and uh, so you, you don't want to do that. So we just compared to what we have in the past. And the main thing we compared is the TTR, the Amnest Norfolk. And you can see the TTR with Amvutra uh, also dropped down, uh, maybe a little bit better than Patisiran, actually, because with Patisiran, you see here in the dark blue or the navy blue between around 70%, whereas with Amvutra, it even drops to 80%, and at some point, even more. So really a, a very good drug. Um, same thing with Eplotercin, it drops down to about 80%. Uh, you know, compared to the historical placebo. And again, the MNIS is good. Uh, the Norfolk is good. You can see here with the Eplotercin, the MNIS is stable. So actually a little bit better than Inotercin, but it's hard to compare trial to trial, you know, study to study. As Dr. Uray showed you before, it's really hard to, you can, unless you're doing a head-to-head -head trial, you cannot compare historical trial to, to newer trial with with improved how we treat patient, et cetera. And the Norfolk quality of life here is uh, improved actually. So that's also a very good thing. And then same thing with the Amvutra, uh, decrease in the MNIS and, and the Norfolk scores. So these drugs also work and that's why I do recommend them to, to my patients instead of the old ones. Um, adverse event, there's some adverse event, but again, nothing really serious, uh, uh, either neither in the Aplotercin or the in the Amfutra uh, uh, study. So now we talked about the four drugs that are approved currently by the uh, FDA for the treatment of H A T T R neuropathy. Again, they they make difference. So the FAMDIS is approved for the cardiomyopathy. Uh, but I will just very briefly, uh, because I have a few minutes left, talk about the other drugs. So do, do the other drug work on the neuropathy. And why is this important? Because a lot of patients are just on one of the agents. They're not on, on combination therapy. And actually, I'm not super sure. I'll show you some data on the combination therapy to discuss whether this is uh, really beneficial or not. But this is the diflunazole. Again, diflunazole is an anti-inflammatory drug. Um, so And it's uh, off-label. It is uh, cheap. It is available usually in the pharmacy. So you can just go pick it up if it's prescribed. And it has showed also that it worked on the neuropathy. Um, um, same thing for the tafamidus. Tafamidus was studied actually on neuropathy first uh, back in the uh, early 2000s or 2010, 2011, I think. 
And uh, again, both of these drugs show that they do work on the neuropathy. So if you're on of one of these drugs um, and you have a little bit of neuropathy, maybe it will kind of make you feel a little bit safe that you are also addressing the neuropathy, especially if the neuropathy is, is kind of mild. Um, so what about combination therapy? And I don't know how many uh, patients end up on combination therapy. We looked at it in, in our cohort and a significant number actually of patients end up on combination therapy. So if you have both phenotype, meaning you have ca cardiomyopathy and neuropathy, the likelihood of being on combination therapy is like 60%, so very high. Um, I think now things are a little bit changing because of insurance issues. But if you have neuropathy, you, you're going to get the silencer. And if you have cardiomyopathy, you're going to get the stabilizers. And if you have both, because the FDA approved the drug this way, we, you can, in, in theory, prescribe both. So is there an added benefit of using both? And the answer is that we don't know. We tried to look up to one year, and now we're doing the analysis for two years follow-up. So hopefully we'll have more data. Maybe we need two more years. Remember that the famidus and, uh, and acromidus uh, data didn't show benefit until over a year, like a year and a half, I think, or two years. Um, and looking at the hospitalization here uh, in people with combination versus monotherapy, it's about the same. Uh, and looking at the survival uh, is also uh, about the same. So we're reanalyzing the data. Now we have another year of follow-up or plus. So we'll see if the uh, these numbers change and we can make recommendation whether you need to be on combination versus monotherapy. Uh, but as long as you're on one treatment, I think it's probably enough uh, at this stage. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions as they come by. Thank you so much, Dr. Karam. We'll, we'll be back with questions after we hear from Dr. Yuri because a lot of the treatments that you uh, just talked about are in clinical trials for ATTR cardiomyopathy. So Dr. Yuri, let's hear all about it. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm glad to follow Dr. Karam because some of the stuff that I'll be discussing um, will be directly related to what he's covered. Um, I'm going to be going over the drugs and clinical trials, but I just want to make a caveat uh, that it's going to be the silencers. I will come back later on after the break and discuss the um, the antifibrils or the antibodies. Um, so I won't be covering that now. So just I, I want to remind everyone this picture. I'm going to reference this one more time uh, later on in the day, but my focus now will be on the silencer. So as Dr. Karam pointed out, uh, this is because most of the TTR is made in the liver. So now we're looking at some of the therapies that have already been approved for neuropathy. And then also we'll cover some um, that are in clinical trial. And I, I have petistrin shown there and it's crossed out and that's intentional. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's the case later on. Um, but I, I want to just give, give a little bit of a framework. So the reason why we're interested in these therapies in cardiomyopathy is because we're not talking about two different diseases when we talk about polyneuropathy and cardiomyopathy. And sometimes when we discuss one therapy for maybe the, you know, the symptoms related to polyneuropathy or heart failure or, or cardiomyopathy, it sounds like we're talking about separate conditions. They're actually the same condition and I'll submit to you that it's probably a spectrum of symptoms. Um, many patients will have mainly neuropathy, but some degree of heart involvement, and the reverse is also true. Many will have cardiomyopathy, and then some degree of polyneuropathy. Um, the way the clinical trials have been created, though, have been specific, specifically enrolling certain populations. That's why we sometimes think about it as separate diseases, even though that's not the case. Uh, Dr. Karam already just went over this in a lot of detail, so I'll be brief, but uh, I'm, I want to focus uh, just on the ones that are in active clinical trials uh, for the cardiomyopathy. And before, just to lay the groundwork, before we got to these trials, the polyneuropathy trials did have analysis of the patients that had heart involvement, and we did have a lot of um, at least suggestive evidence that this would also work in, in cardiomyopathy. So this is Ambutra, um, as Dr. Karam already mentioned, but it works at the level of the hepatocyte, the liver cell. And um, Ambutra, when it's given as a subcutaneous injection, 
um, also known as utricerin, goes directly to the liver and essentially will degrade the messenger RNA, um, both for wild type or the, uh, the non-hereditary form and the hereditary or, or also called variant form. And, um, and by doing so, you'll let, get less TTR production. So by getting less TTR production or that four leaf clover that I mentioned, you'll have less of the precursor that leads to the amyloid uh, formation. So by again, by doing that, then you have less amyloid that can get into the different tissues, including the heart. Um, Wainua is also uh, in clinical trial for cardiomyopathy. The other name is Eplon Tersen. And this is also a depiction of the mechanism. And it's very uh, similar in, in, in the sense that it goes to the liver cell, the hepatocyte. It'll get incorporated into the cell and then it'll lead to degradation of this messenger RNA, which is essentially the code that the cell has to make this protein, um, the TTR protein. So you may ask, well, what if I'm getting rid of TTR? Is that gonna be harmful? And we know that TTR, that protein is conserved, meaning it is produced by all mammals. Um, but the, the, the proteins that it transports, that's actually the full name of TTR is transporter of thyroxine and retinol. The proteins that it transports throughout the blood, throughout the circulation, are actually ones that have other mechanisms and other ways of getting to the tissue they need to get to. So we, we believe that it can be safe to eliminate or decrease TTR production. Um, and that's, again, the, the way that these exhibit their benefit. So you'll see that both therapies, again, Mvutra and Wainua will decrease TTR levels. Uh, Dr. Karam already showed this, um, so I, I'll go over this briefly. But when you're looking at TTR levels, your hope is that you get as low as possible when you start these therapies. And on the top, that's from uh, the, the um, neuropathy trial um, that led to, uh, to the approval of Mvutra. And you'll see in the lighter blue uh, that you have greater than 80% reduction in TTR levels. Again, that's the goal is to try to get it as low as possible. Um, in the bottom panel, that's for Wainu or, or Eplontersen. In the gold line, you'll see also a pro less than 80% um, or greater than 80% reduction in TTR levels. So when you think about it, as Dr. Karam also pointed out, if you're on tefamidus or acaramidus, and some of, some of the doctors, myself included, will actually follow TTR levels, the assay that you can get checked is actually prealbumin. That's the same as the TTR level. So if I start a patient on tefamidus, I check that, and I want to see that the TTR level goes up, or prealbumin increases. Um, if I start some patients on one of these therapies, then when I check those uh, lab tests, I want it to get as close to zero as possible, um, as low as possible. Um, now, uh, also, Dr. Ron mentioned the, the difficulty interpreting if you're on both. So I, I won't necessarily go into that in more detail than from what Dr. Karam mentioned, but just to highlight that it, it becomes a little bit more confusing. Um, I do want to mention that it is important when you're on a silencer, and this will come to the clinical trials that I'll cover later on, uh, the recommendation for supplementation is vitamin A at the recommended daily allowance. So the, one of the side effects of these medications is um, night blindness, um, and vitamin A can dramatically reduce your risk of having that complication. We don't check vitamin A levels. We don't supplement with higher doses to try to overcome this. It's just the recommended daily allowance. And if you have any concerns of like night blindness or eye changes, then you should mention it immediately to your doctor so they can send you to see an ophthalmologist. So where do we stand with uh, these silencers for cardiomyopathy? Now, we, we heard nice evidence to support their use in polyneuropathy. Um, and, and I've already highlighted that these neuropathy trials, and I, I didn't mention all the studies, Texeti trials within and Texeti or Inotersin and Patisserin and Onpatro, um, those are other therapies that have also shown benefit in the heart outcomes in the polyneuropathy trial. So we do believe that there will be a role for these therapies in the future for those that have cardiomyopathy. So there's two trials that I want to mention, Helios B. 
Um, enrollment is now closed, and that's with Amvutra or Vutricerin. Um, now, many patients or many that are in trial or that are following closely uh, probably heard about the change in, um, in the data, uh, uh, in the outcomes um, recently. So we expected to have a readout or a preliminary data um, by now, but that's been pushed out to June or July 2024. Now, it's easy to become skeptical or worry that that means, well, does someone know something that I don't know? Is the therapy's not working? And um, and this is, of course, all post to Al Nylum, the company that has uh, this, this trial. And I would just mention that we don't know. So while I think those concerns are valid, um, the response that we got from Al Nylum was that uh, they looked at other trials and other experiences. And I've already alluded to you and highlighted that as we enroll patients in these newer trials on a background of treatment, and also we're enrolling healthier patients, that we may not be able to compare trials to trials. And the Helios B trial was designed using older, older data. So the response is that even though, you know, the trial outcome changed, they added three months to it, um, I, I don't necessarily believe that suggests that um, insider scoop that they have is that it's not working. It just means that they had to t consider some of the other trial data um, before they decided to have a readout or an early preliminary review of the data. We do expect that later this year. For CardioTransform, Wainua or Epilon Tercin, that, that trial is also closed. Um, so no more enrollment. It's the largest amyloid trial to date, over 1,400 patients. And we expect to read on 2025, but um, I also anticipate with it being such a large trial, and I'm hopeful that we may have a readout earlier than expected. Um, so a lot of excitement in the future with these two trials. Um, what these trials will not be able to answer, and I want to be very clear about this, they won't be able to answer is, um, Vutra better than Wainua is better, better than Akaramidus or better than Tefamidus. So they're not head-to-head -head trials. And, and as we've been highlighting over the, the last hour or so, comparison claims are, are false. So if anyone makes that, um, I, I would just be very skeptical of that. And I strongly would recommend you discuss the pros and cons of the different therapies as they become available um, with your physician and determine what is the right therapy for you. Now, I, I had on the, on the, um, the first slide, um, Patisserin, and I crossed that out. Why did I cross that out? Well, many patients were enrolled in Apollo B. Patisserin, 12-month trial, looking at Patisserin uh, for cardiomyopathy. And this is based on the data from the earlier trials, Apollo A, that showed, um, at least the exploratory data showed benefit in the cardiac subpopulation um, in the neuropathy trial. So I, I want to show a little bit about, uh, about the Apollo B data, because I think this gives us a little bit of a, of a lesson that we need to consider. And the Apollo B data or trial was 12 months, and they were essentially hoping that with um, six-minute walk and functional changes, you would be able to, uh, they would be able to get approval. Unfortunately, and I say unfortunately because I do believe this therapy does work. Um, the FDA did not agree that that was enough of an outcome that could lead to approval, particularly when there was already a, a standard of care, which would be tefamidus. But if we follow out um, the data past the 12 months, this is the open label exten extension data uh, that was um, presented at one of the cardiology meetings uh, by Matt Maurer and others, uh, Matt Maurer from Columbia you'll see that in terms of NT pro BNP, that when you're on patisserin, um, you have much, much lower uh, increase in NT pro BNP compared to placebo. And I've already mentioned that an increase in pro NT pro BNP is bad. So there does seem to be benefit there. And then when you see all cause mortality over two years, um, you'll see that there's separation. Blue is uh, patisserin. Uh, the I guess the pink line is uh, is placebo, there's separation. Now, because the trials are small and there's not enough patients to say that's statistically significant, 
I'm, I'm not going to make a claim and say that patients live longer, but there certainly seems to be a benefit or at least a trend in that direction. And unfortunately, I think this is a, a missed opportunity because this therapy is not going to be FDA approved for cardiomyopathy. That being said, many patients are in the, in the early access program that was began by Al Nylum. Um, and many of my patients have at least reported to me benefit from that. So I've encouraged them to stay in the early access program as long as it's, it's available through the L-Nylum uh, program. So I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about gene editing and TLA 2001. Um, this is a lot of interest in the field, and this is um, essentially CRISPR-Cas9 or a way of, um, of delivering a therapy with a one-time injection or infusion and leading to either a change in the protein uh, composition uh, or the DNA composition, or essentially leading to eliminating production of a protein. So let's talk about how this works. So NTLA is given as a uh, infusion, and there's immediate and rapid distribution uh, to the liver. And by doing so, it incorporates into the liver and will essentially um, uh, cut the DNA and then lead to no DN uh, or uh, no TTR production. So similar to what I've described with the other silencers, um, they had a, a trial looking at patients and they infused them with different doses. And you saw that with higher doses, you had a pretty significant upwards of 90% in some patients suppression of TTR. And again, we know that TTR is the protein that leads to amyloid. So you can imagine that if you can suppress TTR production with a one-time infusion, then maybe you can stop um, amyloid uh, pr production and stop the disease, halt the disease wherever you're at. It doesn't, it doesn't work at reversing the disease that's already been deposited, uh, but again, it does uh, stop the disease there, or that's the idea. And I say that's the idea because we don't have those outcomes data. We have a a mechanism that looks very interesting and very exciting. And then the next step, of course, is actually proving that in a clinical trial. So there is a, tr a trial, that um, a phase three trial. This is some of the inclusion criteria. You have to have, um, of course, cardiomyopathy from TTR, history of heart failure, um, and remember NT pro BNP, uh, in the tefamidus arm was 600, in the acaramidus arm was 300, and then in this trial it has to be greater than 1,000, greater than 2,000 if an atrial fibrillation. Some of the inclusion criteria that may be of interest to folks on the call, advanced kidney disease, any time use of vutricerin or amvutra. If you've received one dose, you've been, you, you're excluded, or use of onpatro or Wainua within the last 12 months. Um, I just reviewed on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, which has essentially um, um, the, the trials registered. Right now in the U.S., uh, MedStar is the active enrolling site. There may be others just because it's not updated every day, and I think Intelia will be able to share if there's, what sites are activated. At UC San Diego, uh, we will be a future site. We've been approved for the trial, uh, just not activated or we're not recruiting yet for this trial. And um, with that, I'll, I'll end and uh, also uh, open it up to questions or uh, Muriel, if you want to. Yes, we, we will definitely open up to question, a few questions now before we take a break. And so we'll ask Dr. Karam to unmute and uh, we'll, we'll take some questions. And we do have Pharma making some presentations later on. So uh, the, some of these drugs that Dr. Karam and Dr. Yuri have been discussing will be discussed even, even further and they'll be telling us probably where some of these trials are so open. So that'll be pretty exciting. Uh, we, we, you, you actually answered some of the questions that were asked during your presentations, which we appreciate. But one of you know Peter's question is thank you for the information. He's been told that silencers work only for patients with hereditary. He has wild type, but wonders that they work for me. And you did a great job of explaining to clinical trials that the silencers are in for cardiomyopathy, and that uh, so I, I guess we could say that question was answered. Um, another the, this this comes up a lot. People are who have wild type, uh, uh, and people don't talk about 
neuropathy with wild type, but we know that they do have neuropathy. So Dr. Uh, Karan, this question is, uh, how do these drugs work on wild type with some neuropathy? Yeah, that's a great uh, question, and it, it is a common uh, concern for for the wild type patient that that I see. Uh, but unfortunately, it has not been uh, studied in a, in a clinical trial, mainly because the neuropathy is also not very um, it doesn't cause a lot of weakness, and the weakness is what we really measure as an outcome. Uh, that's the the main thing that changes. Um, now. To, to be kind of reassuring is that the silencers silence all type of TTR, not just the, uh, you know, uh, HATTR, but the wild type TTR. So all TTR is going to be silenced. So in theory, um, it should be helping. Um, one thing that I'd like to note is a lot of people with wild type TTR have spinal stenosis and the symptoms can look like neuropathy. So it's a different problem. The problem is mechanical at the level of the spine where the amyloid is compressing on the nerve roots. Um, and there's also other reason to people for to have neuropathy. So as you get older, the incidence of neuropathy goes up. Uh, you know, at some point it becomes 10 and even 15%. So there are other causes for neuropathy as well. So uh, to summarize, in theory, they should work. They haven't been studied specifically for that. Two, make sure there's nothing else going on, like people don't have diabetes or other reason to have neuropathy or spinal stenosis, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, this is an interesting question. Will there be studies with various combinations of stabilizers? Dr. Yuri, we'll let you take that. Would there be any point to someone taking tephamidus and ecaramidus and dexalunitol, all three? I don't, there won't be any studies um, in those. And... Uh, that that's an interesting question. I, I do think if there's any role for combination, it would be hitting it at different points in the pathway. So I don't necessarily think that that conceptually I can uh, make an argument for stabilizers, multiple stabilizers, multiple silencers, or multiple antifibrils. But I think the question that we won't be able to easily answer. But is there a role for one, one drug from one class, like a silencer and a stabilizer? We do it already, but that's in the absence of data. Dr. Karam showed some of the uh, UPenn data on that, um, but we do it already. I just don't think that it'll be tefamidus, acaramidus, and diflunosol, any combination of that will, will be considered. And also, I don't think pairs are not going to cover that. So even if uh, you know there was some thought that that could work, it just won't be covered that way. Gotcha. This is an interesting question. Uh, patients, regardless of size, take one Vindamax. Should larger people be taking a higher dose? Um, no. I mean, the 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 reason 20 and 80 were studied, 20 was one based on the, the data from uh, Europe, the neuropathy trials uh, that had been used in 20. 80 was the dose that was max stabilization. So higher doses didn't necessarily translate to more stabilization. That's why those doses were picked. So we know even though 20 and 80 were used in combo in the trial, some patients were on 20, some were on 80, you get less increase in things like NT pro BNP that we know is bad with the 80 milligrams compared to the 20. So everyone, we recommend the 80 milligram dose that translates to the 61 of Vindam Vindamax. Um, but higher doses, no, there's no, no evidence to support that more is needed based on weight. Okay. And this question, I don't really understand. Why do silencers not work for cardiomyopathy? Well, we were at, those are in clinical trials. You, you shared that with us. So I think that maybe that person might be, they, they, they do, we, we expect, I, I think they're going to, we're going to show that they likely will work. Um, but, the the outcomes studied and the patients enrolled in the prior trials are not sufficient to make us or to allow us to make that claim just yet. So more to come. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, any advantage to taking tefamidus and or patisseran after a heart transplant? So that that's a great question. Um, uh, so there's no data for it, um, but I will tell you that my practice, I'm a heart transplant cardiologist, and much of the community uh, after heart transplant, we do try to continue those that have wild type on tefamidus. 
uh, because we recognize that the musculoskeletal system and possibly other organs are at risk. Um, and it's also very easily tolerated. So that's why for the hereditary population, um, particularly ones that had, you know, more heart symptoms, as soon as they get their transplant, the amyloid doesn't go away. They just replace the organ that's most affected. Um, so many of my patients were on patisseran after transplant. And um, in the current era, many of my patients are on uh, Wainua or uh, Vutriceran post-heart transplant. Gotcha. They have an, a reason for it. So it's not just because they have hereditary uh, TTR. They have also a polyneuropathy. So it's based on that indication of polyneuropathy. And Dr. Karam, do you have anything to add to that? No, I agree with that. Okay, great. Uh, I've been on Patisseran for 13 months with a steadily worsening condition generally. What length of treatment are you seeing with Patisseran when some improvement is observed? So how long would you would it take before someone might see some not getting worse, I guess? You wouldn't really see improvement, right? You'd see someone not getting worse. Yeah, I mean, as as we showed in the talk, you know, about 10% people get wor uh, better, uh, maybe about 45% are stable and then about 25% get worse. So, um, and, and getting worse is tricky. What is worse? Is the pain worse, the diarrhea worse, the lightheadedness uh, or the disability or the shortness of breath? So really depending on sometimes things may look worse, but they may be addressed in a different way than Batisiran and, and, and the other drugs. So uh, it, it's, it's a difficult question to to answer without knowing what specifically is getting worse. Gotcha. Now, if someone if someone is not doing well on Patisserie, let's say they're on two years and the, like this patient or whatever, 18 months, would you switch them then to Wainua? Is that a, something you might do? Uh, you could consider it. I mean, we don't have any data on that. So it would just be, you know, um, something anecdotal. And it's again, what what is doing worse? What is their TTR level? Uh, what is the NFL level? I mean, these are things that we can look at as well to determine. Um, but at, at this point, we don't have any specific guidance. Uh, but I guess that's a that's a possibility. If somebody's not feeling good on one drug, maybe they can try the other. But uh, it would be interesting down the road to collect that data and see if there's actually any uh, benefit or, or in switching. Okay. Um, is it expected... This is for either one of you. Is it expected that Mvutra will be approved for wild type, either cardiomyopathy and or, well, it's already approved for peripheral neuropathy. So I guess the question would be, is it expected that Mvutra would be approved for cardiomyopathy? And Dr. Yuri, you went into that uh, in your discussion. Yeah, so I would say that the more options is always better. So the hope is that it will be approved. What do we need to get to to, uh, to reach that point is we have to have good data. Um, we are anxiously awaiting the data from the trials to tell us if uh, if it's showing the benefit we we hope and expect to see. Um, I, I mentioned the the change in the outcomes for our Mbucha trial, um, not to suggest it's not going to work or it's not going to be a positive trial, but just to highlight the challenges in clinical trials right now because compared to when a tract was uh, conducted, which is the Pfizer to Famitis trial, we have a lot of different ways we manage patients mm -hmm. now. So the patient, the trials will likely need to be larger, longer um, for us to see the outcomes we, we hope and expect to see from these interventions. So I, I hope so, but I don't have any insider scoop in terms of what the data looks like. Gotcha, okay. Lumbar spinal stenosis is becoming a major issue. Can't walk more than 100 feet. Is this related to increasing polyneuropathy? Have been on tefamidus for five plus years for cardiac involvement, which seems to be working. So this, I would guess this person has wild type, but Dr. Karam. Yeah, so again, spinal stenosis and neuropathy or polyneuropathy are two different problems. And it's very important to differentiate which one the person has because Spinal stenosis is a mechanical problem, meaning you have the position of the amyloid and the uh, ligament, uh, and these are compressing on the nerve, and that could be resolved by surgery. 
So if the patient is candidate for surgery, uh, so what I would suggest is to see a neurologist, get an evaluation, get an opinion regarding, it looks like they're having claudication, spinal claudication, which is from spinal stenosis. Um, and, and they may benefit from a surgery if they're, if they're a, a good candidate for it. So that would be the, the treatment in that situation if the problem are from the spinal stenosis, not from the neuropathy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, person, do ATTR patients produce any normal TTR or only amyloid? So I think this is re uh, uh, asking about HATTR. So if the person is heterozygote for the condition, which is usually the case, meaning they have inherited one single gene, so let's say they inherited the V30M TTR variants, then they're going to produce 50-50, right? Because each gene will produce, the normal gene will produce normal TTR, and the V30M gene will, will produce the TTR that is prone to uh, amyloidosis. Now, we've seen homozygous cases where people have inherited both a TTR variant from the mother and from the father, and these people will always produce the TTR that is prone to amyloidosis. Okay. If my prealbumin is three greater than or undetectable, is that lower than the 80% your tests, your displays are showing today? I am confused, but which one of you would get that one? Uh, the the prealbumin depends on your lab. Like our lab doesn't go down as low as zero. So it'll report it as less than three. That's the lowest it can detect. Um, and my thought is that lower is better. Um, so, uh, if there are, if you're on patisserin or, or I, I'm just going to say silencer, so I wouldn't go all, all, over all four, but if you're on a silencer and you're less than three, then you're suppressing TTR production significantly. Okay. Um, okay. Um, in addition to the above comparison of heart MRIs 2022 and February 2024, show no significant worsening of the heart function. That's not really a question, is it? Okay, let's skip that one. Uh, in case of NTLA 2001, okay, NTLA 2001, that would be the... It's okay. Uh, do you expect the long-term use of vitamin A or has that there been any discussion? Uh, are you in on, well, you know that trial, so you would know if there is. Vitamin A, yeah, there's a recommendation for a long-term use of vitamin A. Okay. And, and, and I think the folks from Intellia later on, if they can recall that question in case I uh, answer that incorrectly, but yeah, long-term vitamin A is what, what I understand. Okay, great. Um. I have both cardiac and neurological HATTR and have been on a silencer and stabilizer since 2017. My cardiologist is now recommending that I take Defamidus with Dexlunastol instead of with Antetro. Take Defamidus with Dexlunastol. We were just discussing, you know, mixing mixing stabilizers instead of with Antetro, presumably because of the cost to the HMO, saying that Defamidus and Batisran are the same. Oh, maybe in cost or to, I don't, I'm confused. I think, I yeah, have, I think there's a confusion here with the drugs. Yeah. Um. So if they're, it, why would their doctor has, help me here? Well, if, if that's the case, if that is a real recommendation, I would be very surprised, but that med medically doesn't have a basis for it. Um. Th it is a correct that the, these medications are very high cost. Um, but the, the that's that's policy will address that issue, not patients, in my opinion. Okay. Is wild type really rare? Not according to Matt Marr. Well, then we'll say it's not rare, right? <laughs> there you go. Um, are we, yes, we're going to be covering the antibody therapies. Uh, stay tuned after the break. Okay. Um, I'm 77 and have wild type. Why, why is measuring the thickness of the heart not a good indicator of the progression of the disease? 
Also, MUNT pro BNP was 18, 19, and 12 months later, 14, 13. I'm on tefamidus. Is that a good indicator? Um, the echo changes um, were fairly neutral in the track trial, so we don't necessarily get too much from the echo. The other question that we always ask is, what is going to change our management? So if I were to say, well, the echo increased the thickness of the heart over two years, it still doesn't change our management. It may have a role down the road when uh, we have more options available, but right now it doesn't necessarily, aside from investigation and research, I don't think it provides much information. Although just being fully transparent, anecdotally, I, I, I may get an echo every couple of years. Um, in anticipation of new therapies, I want to see where things stand. Antipro BNP decreasing. I, I think of antipro BNP the higher, uh, the more advanced disease. So a decrease um, would be would be, I would say, a positive thing. Now I, I would be very hesitant to just take two levels and make you know big assumptions there. It's really a trend over time that's important. Um, stability, et cetera, because antipro BNP can change because of a number of things, kidney function, or if you're retaining more fluid that day when you took the test or dehydrated, et cetera. So two, two points of antipro BNP, it's interesting, but really a trend over years is, is probably more interesting or more indicative of where the disease lies. Okay, great. We'll just, uh, we have time for one more. Well, oh, but this is just an FYI. Someone had to stop diflunoxol because of GI issues, but, um, I'm sure we've heard that before. Okay. Does Anvutra affect oxygen levels? A uh, husband on it having oxygen levels that fluctuate can be in the low 80s to upper 90s throughout the day. Yeah, no, it it and it should not affect the oxygen level. I would uh, look, I mean, this is a serious problem and I would investigate this further with the physician. Okay. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll take more questions later. Folks, then if you email them in, we'll we'll email back your your answers too. So we 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 will try and get everything answered. Um, but we uh, we really want to take a quick break. Uh, well, let's take a ten minute break, and when we come back, we'll have uh, we'll have we'll talk about anti fibrils. We'll talk about Dr. Jonathan Wall's new studies. We'll get some financial aid availability, and we'll hear from pharma. So lots more coming. So let's take that ten minute break. Okay. Okay, we're back. Uh, before we hear uh, from Dr. Yuri about the antifibrils and have some more Q&A and hear from Dr. Wall, um, Paula will be sharing some news of financial aid that might be available for us. So, Paula, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, and while Bob is pulling up my slides, I uh, just want you to know that, uh, you know, there is some assistance out there and uh, you have to you have to repeatedly check on it, but uh, let's take a look at it now. Uh, next slide, please. First, I'm gonna talk about genetic testing, which is something we've not touched on today uh, that I noticed anyway. Um, if you have a family member, if you have hereditary TTR and have a family member that needs to be tested, they can contact Alnylam Act, go to this website and um, possibly get free genetic testing done and also have the opportunity to have genetic uh, counseling done. This is just for the U.S. and possibly for Canada. So uh, if you live in a country other than that, we will have to uh, address this in a different way. Next slide, please. All right. The drug companies, each one of them has a program that can help you with um, information or possibly financial assistance for these drugs. If you contact each one of them, and I have listed them in the chat already, you can go there and see the websites. Um, but contact these first. They will tell you what you need to do. Um, Wainua also has a website called AZ and Me, which I am about to, to uh, post in the chat as well that uh, can help you if you're underinsured or have no insurance, um, you may be able to qualify for assistance through them to access the drug. 
some of these companies, you can get the drug um, possibly for free. Vend Vendical and Vendamax um, or Vendamax is available sometimes if you are under the 300% poverty rate level now. Um, the levels are included in a chart that I posted in the chat. Uh, you can see that. We'll also take a look at it in a minute. Um, but you want to, like I said, contact these people first, and then they may tell you, contact the foundations, the Copay Foundations, and next slide, I'll tell you about those. So next slide, please, Bob. There is currently only one fund that is open right now that I found, and that is with the Healthwell Foundation. It is not the amyloid fund, which pays $8,000 a year if you look under amyloidosis. But if you have cardiomyopathy or on Medicare and make less than, less than or equal to 500% of the federal poverty guidelines, this cardiomyopathy fund, you should apply for it. It pays ten thousand dollars per year uh, on your on your copays for your for your drugs, or you can choose to have it cover your Medicare premiums. You can't do both; you can do one or the other, but you can change that designation one time per year. So if you decide that, uh, or if you meet your out of pocket maximum for the year for the drug payment, you can then possibly try to switch it over to where it will make your Medicare payments. So uh, contact them. You can you can go online and register. And um, this fund, I have not seen it close. The amyloidosis fund closes often. It will reopen sometimes. So you want to sign up for the wait lists that they have. You want to sign up for all of these all of these organizations wait lists um, and they will send you an email if their wait list opens uh, stating to go ahead and apply for it if you still have a need for the drug. Now the patient access network, they dropped their financial assistance amount down to $3,250 this year. And that has to do with the fact that the, uh, the Affordable Care Act had made the uh, amount that people have to pay out of pocket each year less than what it was last year. Next year, it will be a $2,000 limit on what Medicare Part D patients have to pay. So I fully expect the Patient Access Network to drop that number again next year. They may not, but I would expect it. Um, the Assistance Fund, you actually need to sign up for that one in the in the fall, early, early winter, in, um, say November, December, it lists it on their website, and then they will contact you. you. You sign up and join up on their wait list, and they will contact you when they are enrolling patients. Um, so be sure to sign up for that list this fall. Um, next slide, please. This is a listing of the federal poverty rate guidelines. Many of these organizations use the 500% column. So right now, uh, for like the Healthwell Foundation uh, grant, if you have a household with two people, you can make $102,200 per year and still qualify for that grant. Um, the amount that you can make and have Pfizer still pay for your drug because they drop down to 300% level. That would be 61320 now for a two-person family. So um, it, if you try to apply for free drug through Pfizer, you have to meet that amount. Um, if you live in a city that has a higher cost of living, such as New York City, LA, somewhere large like that, um, be sure to give them a call because they sometimes will raise the rate um, that you can make and still qualify for a specific fund. So call whichever organization you are applying to to see if they will give you any leeway if you make 
$102,300 and you live in LA, you can probably make more than that and qualify. And then if you live in Alaska or Hawaii, um, the same applies for those two places. You have that higher threshold that you can, uh, of money that you can make each year. Next slide. Also find sign up for the Fun Finder. Um, they call it the Fun Finder app through the uh, Pan Foundation. This will also send you emails when a fund opens up. It's just another thing to alert you. Some are, some are quicker at alerting you than others. So I sign up for everything I can, and it can be ben beneficial to do that sometimes. So sign up for the, the, fan, the Fund Finder app. And if a fund is open, as you can see on this, um, on my slide here, it shows Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and has a green lock. That's simply showing you that what it shows if there is a fund that's open, you're going to see that green lock instead of the red closed lock. And no, you cannot apply through the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. That's more for our AL patients. But this was the only slide I had that showed an open lock. So I wanted you to see that. But that is basically it. If you have any questions, you can email me at paula at amyloidosissupport.org, and I will try to get you an answer. So thank you very much for attending today. Thank you so much, Paula. That was really helpful. Um, and now we will, Dr. Yuri, we will hear all about antifibril treatments that are under investigation right now. So take it away. All right. Thank you. Um, let me just share screen. So I'm, I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit about the antifibril therapies. Um, and I just want to, again, remind everyone uh, that th these are all trials that you may consider joining, along with the CRISPR trial that I mentioned in the prior uh, talk. So just as a reminder, we're going back to the same image. Um, now we're talking to the far right. So amyloid fibrils and going directly to the organ where the amyloid's infiltrated or uh, where the amyloid is located. These are the, with the use of antibodies and antibodies will essentially activate the immune system and lead to um, degradation or, or remove the an amyloid fibril. So where does this concept come from? And this is a paper from the group in the UK at the National Amyloidosis Center, and they reported that patients that had amyloid spontaneously reversed their heart disease. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of images from MRI. You'll see the ones on the left, the darker images, and hopefully I can uh, get you to see that the septum, that big darker area in the middle, is fairly thick. Um, and then if you look at three years right next to it, you'll see that that septum, that area has decreased. And if you go down and look at the images at the bottom on the left-hand side, there's that uh, white area in the middle that corresponds to that thick area that I previously showed you or mentioned. And that is what we call late gadolinium enhancement or LGE. And often we see this in diseases that cause scarring of the heart or an amyloid, it, it gives us an idea, at least that's how we think about it, of maybe the amount of amyloid in the heart. And I say maybe because that's a little bit of debate. Um, but it, you'll see over the three-year span that that LGE, that white area, decreased significantly. Now I'm going to move over to that colorful uh, image that says extracellular volume map. And we know that patients with amyloid because you're getting infiltration or you're, you're, you're um, getting amyloid that builds up in the heart, you have not just cells in the heart, but you also have this extracellular um, protein-like material. And we can actually quantify this. We can see how much of that is present. More of it is suggestive of more amyloid. And um, I won't, go, I won't walk, walk over or go over the, the different colors, but I just want to highlight that in a time span of three years, we see that the extracellular volume decreases. And then going down to the bottom, many people know the pyrophosphate scan. In the UK and Europe, they use DPD, which is essentially similar to the pyrophosphate scan. But you'll see that there's dark uh, uptake in the heart, 
on the left, uh, the bottom right corner. And then three years later, you'll see that there's very minimal uptake in the heart. That dark area is much decreased. So how did this happen? Well, the UK reported patients spontaneously reversed their heart disease. And when they analyzed their blood, they noticed that these patients had developed autoantibodies, meaning that they developed their immune system uh, was able to essentially clear the amyloid from their hearts. Um, so this, uh, and also there was already interest in this, in this area, uh, will allow us to discuss antibodies as a therapy. So I want to show you um, uh, some imaging from the NNC 6019 data. This is from the group in Madrid. Uh, Dr. Pablo Garcia Pavia showed this, and uh, a number of patients were enrolled in, in a, a phase one trial, and essentially were, they were given an infusion of an antibody, and, um, and, and I won't go over the full trial in detail because I just want to give you the concept. Uh, but it essentially, if you look at the pyrophosphate or the, I'm sorry, the nuclear scan uptake, they use a different tracer, not pyrophosphate, but the nuclear scan uptake, you'll see that it's very dark. And I, I think just visually, if you just pay attention to the, uh, the changes over time at four months and at, at 12 months, you'll see that there's much less uptake. So we know that the darker, the color there, that, that reflects more amyloid. Um, and then you see at the bottom, patient two, an 82-year-old man, the first part of the trial, he received placebo. So not much change in the uptake. It's pretty dark, and it remains dark at four months. And then he received the actual treatment. And then at 12 months, you'll see that it's decreased. The uptake, you see it's less dark. Um, so again, th these are medications that will uh, that are given via infusion, and there's a number of them that I'll comment on, um, and then will lead to they bind the amyloid fibril in the heart. They actually often will bind the amyloid that's also circulating, so hopefully preventing it from ever getting into the heart, the one that's in the blood circulation. But they will also lead to the immune system to be activated, and uh, the immune system will then remove the amyloid. So some of the data that I think is important is the nt p data. And I've mentioned a few times, nt p the higher, the worse disease. Um, so ideally, now that we have a possible therapy that will reverse this condition, unlike the other trials that I've showed you, hopefully we can see that nt p level start to drop. And you'll see, if you look at the 12-month data, you'll see that there is a decrease. The relative change percentage is negative meaning that nt and p did decrease. Um, suggestive of reversal, at least to some degree, reversal of the amyloid in the heart. Um, so this leads us to, I, I want to discuss two uh, different trials that, um, that may be of consideration for you. Um, Alexion ALXN2200. Um, is, a, is a trial that's enrolling. It's an antibody trial. Um, the nt and p for this trial has to be greater than 2,000. You have to be on some form of diuretic, like Lasix or Bumix. Um, they are enrolling a sicker population. So if you look at the criteria, it's, it's listed as New York Heart Association, um, but they allow up to class four, which have been previously excluded from trials. Um, <clears throat> and, and the reason for that is because this drug is intended to not just slow down, but reverse the disease. That's why sicker patients are uh, the target population. There is currently, and I just checked this last night just to update myself, on cl clinicaltrials.gov, I left the number you could search on there, um, but there's currently 23 states that have been identified and have centers, including four in California. Um, our site being uh, our, our center at San Diego being one of the sites, uh, but I would encourage you to to uh, look on the amyloidosis support group website and also on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, the other thing, I, and this applies really to all trials, um, if you are in an area that does not necessarily have the local center enrolling in a trial, but a trial is of interest to you. I would highly suggest just emailing. They have a contact on clinicaltrials.gov. 
tell them about your interest. They often will link you with the closest enrolling site. And in some cases, even if you're a distance, they, um, the sponsor may cover transport. So if clinical trials is of interest and it's not available down the street, still consider it. Uh, still reach out to uh, you know to the the sponsor or to the um, the closest enrolling site. And and then C six zero what nine, um, that's from uh, Novo Nordisk. The phase two enrollment is now closed, and phase two trial data has not been posted. But we do anticipate uh, based on um, just just what what the the company has uh, shared with us is that the phase three is to begin in the near future. Um, there was questions on uh, that were sent in about phase one, phase two, and phase three. Often, phase three trials are much larger trials. So even if your your local site wasn't a phase one or phase two trial, um, they're often uh, being considered for phase three trials. So much more accessibility to trials if you're interested in that. Um, I don't have all the uh, because of, you know, until they publish their their criteria, I can't share what the inclusion criteria looks like. But because, again, it is a therapy that will reverse the disease, I imagine that it's going to be also advanced disease also is going to be the, the trial uh, criteria to get in. Um, and then I want to mention ATO2 and ATO3. This is from Atralis, and their pipeline is very exciting, not just in uh, treatment options, but also in diagnostics. Um, so they have a number of uh, programs that are in development that are specifically for systemic amyloidosis. Uh, it could be different forms of amyloid. It doesn't have to be TTR because their antibodies will bind a, a region that's seen on different forms of amyloid. And I'm highlighting ATO2 and ATO3 because of the excitement around these two. Um, uh, there's others listed there that all are, are also in different fa in different uh, phases of development. But I would also just um, encourage you to keep an eye out for these therapies. I do expect them to eventually get to phase one, phase two, or some of them are already in phase one. And actually, ATO2 is already in, in phase two. They're rolling over their phase one patients. But this will translate essentially to phase three. Um, I don't have any more slides, but I just wanted to remind everyone that the therapies that are available now for the treatment are a reflection of innovation and also a commitment by many industry partners, but most importantly from patients like yourselves who uh, essentially decided to enroll in clinical trials when there was no options. We do have now, we, we now do have options for treatment, but I would just submit to you that clinical trials remain an integral part of your journey. And at least at my center, I always ask, how can I get patients on an FDA approved therapy? And then number two is understanding that right now we don't have a cure for this disease. How can I get them if they're interested in a trial that makes sense for them? Um, and then they're a candidate for. So we are actively always try to look for clinical trials. And with that, I'll. Uh, I'll end and um, pass it on to pass it back to Muriel. Thank you. Thank you. If you could stay with us, Dr. Yuri and and Dr. Karam, if you could stay with us too. We have we have. I'm going to throw things around a little because I know Dr. Karam is going to have to leave us um, soon, and, and we've got a lot of questions. So if Dr. Wall doesn't mind hanging on for a little bit while we answer some questions, that would be absolutely wonderful. Dr. Karam, are you there, or did you have to leave already? I. There he, oh, there he I'm, is. Great. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I do want to mention, because you, Dr. Yuri, you finished with the Atralis studies, and, and Spencer was originally from Atralis. Spencer Guthrie originally was going to be here today, but for some reason he couldn't make it. So um, if anyone has any questions about the Atralis studies, that, that's the, it, in the treatment chart that the, uh, the pink ATO2 and ATO3 Send me an email if you have any questions, and I'll forward them right on to Spencer, and then he can answer them for you, okay? So, uh, Dr. Karam, uh, this person says, I and, and you know this person, okay, uh, I've had the sensation of warm liquid running down my right leg, and that is happening multiple times during the day on a daily basis. It makes me feel like my bladder has acted on its own. Should I be concerned? It's from Briar. Yeah, that's a bizarre symptom. Um, 
it could so that sensation could be an indication of nerve uh, injury it for polyneuropathy it's typically both feet are affected or both sides are affected so just having one side makes you wonder if there's something else going on so i think it's reasonable to investigate this maybe with nerve conduction study and and uh, maybe an mri to see what is causing these symptoms Okay, and also um, when she was intubated, this might be someone else. When I was intubated for my ablation, the anesthesiologist noted in the my chart uh, under procedure comment, easy mask with 90 mm OPA and a bunch of other stuff. And then they, they mentioned laryngeal amyloidosis. Why would he say something about laryngeal amyloidosis without any bi biopsies being done? Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, I wonder if they saw something that would suggest that maybe there is um, infiltration of the tissue, meaning that maybe they if they saw thickening of the laryngeal cord or or um, tightening of the throat, for example, that could potentially be related to amyloidosis. But the person who's who's wondering about this question is totally correct that. Unless you do a biopsy, you wouldn't necessarily know that there's amyloid deposition there. Great. Dr. Yuri, is the difference between NT pro BNP and pro BNP important? If so, how? So there, there's NT pro BNP and then also BNP. Those are the two that we can. Um, so NT pro BNP and pro BNP are the same. Um, it is important. You can't go from one to the other. So if you're following one, um, you you can't. Can, it's not easy to compare to the other. NT pro BNP is more impacted by kidney function. So if you have another reason why your kidney function is getting worse, and you see a dramatic rise in NT pro BNP, it could reflect kidney issues, not necessarily heart. Um, BNP and NT pro BNP, it really, I guess I would say that it matters mainly on where you're getting followed at and what they have in their lab. Um, for the most part, you can you can follow either of them. That's usually fine, aside from the kidney issues. And then there's certain medications and Tresto, but not many patients with amyloid are on that that can affect the level of um, BNP. So you would have to check NT pro BNP in that case. But as long as you're tracking one, then it's usually okay to continue with that. Okay. You sometimes I've noticed a clinical trial will require NT pro BNP be tracked, but it, yeah, the that's centers only the... track BNP, and then it's kind of confusing, right? Some labs only track BNP. Like some of the like Quest and LabCorp may only have one available depending on what region you're at. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Dr. Karam, what is the most successful form of treatment for hereditary amyloidosis? This is your opinion. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, given the lack of head to head trial, meaning a trial, a study where they compared, uh, people who took, you know, one drug versus the other versus the third option versus the fourth option, it is uh, really impossible to answer this question. Um, I I do think that the silencers work well on the neuropathy. I think they are probably superior to the stabilizers, at, at least the famidus. I, I don't know much about, we don't have experience with acromidus with peripheral neuropathy. So um, that is the best I can answer. So what we end up doing a lot of time is that looking assuming that they're all equivalent, but looking at the side effect profile and at the ease of use, right? So, uh, you know, we had issue with inotercin, we already discussed, so I wasn't prescribing inotercin for a long time. I was mainly prescribing patisiran. And then now that we have both Ambutra and Eplotercin, I'm prescribing those because they're just more um, easy to administer. And we just looking at the TTR suppression, they're all kind of equivalent. So we're based on that, we're thinking that they probably have a similar efficacy. Um, that, that's that's really all I can say. 
Okay, we, we will now give give you let you take your leave, Dr. Karam, because we know you have something else that you have to do today. We really appreciate your coming by. And Dr. Yuri, the burden will fall on you for the rest of the QA, but I know you're up to it. So we thank you so much, Dr. Karam. And um now we'll get back to QA a little bit later. We have a lot of questions to answer, but right now we want to get to Dr. Jonathan Wall. Um, who is kind enough to share us today. He's blurring his kitchen. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Wall, take it away. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a, a study. So in, in Knoxville at the University of Tennessee Graduate School of Medicine, where I'm based, um, we're very interested in developing therapeutics for amyloidosis and all forms of amyloidosis and imaging agents, because as Dr. Uri said, it's really important to identify patients early in any way that we can and in as many ways as, as, as possible. And so we've been working on um, uh, novel agents right now for diagnosing cardiac amyloid. And we've developed this agent that we call P5 plus 14, which is a peptide and it's labeled with a radioactive molecule called technetium, which is the most widely used radioactive molecule in clinic in nuclear medicine. Um, it's the it's the radioactivity that they actually use in the PYP scans that Dr. Uri was mentioning and the studies enrolling. So I'm going to talk about that. I do have some disclosures. The main one is uh, uh, I'm a founder of Atralis and, um, and we invented a lot of this stuff in the lab. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, wrong way. So, so what are we actually using and how does it work? <clears throat> so we came up with in the lab uh, a peptide, which is a small protein, and it forms this beautiful sort of alpha helix that looks like a caterpillar on the run. And it has this incredible property of being able to bind to all forms of amyloid. And <clears throat> that allows us to do lots of interesting things with it. And so the first thing we decided to do was develop an imaging agent and um, to be able to diagnose uh, amyloidosis of any type and be able to detect it in almost any organ in the whole body and then provide quantitation of how much amyloid was there. That was the goal. And for that, we added uh, initially uh, a radioactive molecule called iodine, and we developed an imaging agent for PET imaging. And so PET CT imaging is the type of imaging that's used by oncologists. Mostly it's very commonly used for the diagnosis and monitoring of cancer. And we've been studying that uh, for the last three or four years. But we recognized that there was a need for other options to allow more people to get access to the agent and to be more available throughout the country and in different situations. So now we've labeled that same peptide, which uh, we've demonstrated in our PET imaging study, uh, can bind cardiac amyloid really well in both TTR patients, AL patients, and others. <laughs> but now we've radio labeled it with this molecule called technetium 99, which is really common and very widely available. And cardiologists who are at the forefront of diagnosing TTR patients now have a very used to this type of imaging and imaging this type of radioactivity. And the way we think the peptide works, just by way of an explanation, is if you look on the right-hand side, this is a, a model of an amyloid fibril. This is actually an AL fibril. And <clears throat> this is what they look like at the, at the molecular level. It's lots of repeating units of, in this case, light chains, but TTR fibrils look almost identical to this. So the TTR molecules sort of go off in the distance to infinity. And the peptide itself sort of lies along the long axis of the amyloid. And that's why it combined multiple forms of amyloid. It carries with it the radioactivity so that where the where the peptide binds to the amyloid, the, the radioactivity is present, and then we can image that uh, with a scanner. So the goal for this study um, is to address one of the major problems, and that's early and accurate detection of amyloidosis. Most of the therapeutics that you've heard about, and I'm sure many of the others uh, that are in development will work really well or be best uh, used in patients with small amounts of amyloid where if you slow the disease down, um, you benefit greatly, and then reversal is a lot easier. So our goal with the study was to develop this imaging agent for the specific detection of amyloid of any type, although you'll see in the, in the trial right now that we're actually enrolling TTR and AL patients only. And we wanted to be able to generate images that were easy to interpret, fast to generate, and could show the heart uh, really well. So that would allow cardiologists to use this <laughs> as a first screen to detect amyloid in the heart. Um, <clears throat> so the study is a single site, so we're only doing it in Knoxville at the moment. It's multi-part, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and it's phase one, which means it's the first time this has been in 
uh, in done in patients. The peptide itself, as I mentioned, has been used a lot. So I think over 150 patients have had the peptide, but not in this form with this radioactivity. All the patients who enrolled are outpatients. Many of them, most of them are not from Knoxville, and they have a confirmed diagnosis of AL or TTR within the made within the last four years. And the FDA has required us that you have to have adequate cardiac and hepatic function. And that means you can't, the heart and the liver have to be functioning really pretty well. And also we've evaluated it in healthy volunteers. So the four, four parts that we're looking into are <clears throat> part one, and that's going to be with AL patients only. And we're going to recruit five of them to calculate the amount of radioactivity dose that the patients get uh, based on an injection of this reagent. Part two will enroll 15 uh, subjects. This will be five AL patients and probably 10 TTR patients. We've enrolled four TTR patients so far, and I'll show you some of those images. Part three was the healthy volunteers, just to see where this molecule goes in a healthy volunteer so we can understand what we're looking at in patients, and we've completed that part. And then this interesting part four group, which is a group of patients with TTR amyloidosis who have negative or equivocal PYP scans. That's that scan that Dr. Uri was mentioning that's commonly used to detect amyloid now. And in some cases, it's quite difficult to make a call on whether it's positive or negative. Um, so we were tr recruiting uh, TTR patients who've had a positive cardiac biopsy, so they know there's amyloid there, but their PYP was was not easy to read. So we're going to see how we, we fare in, that, in those patients as well. If you come to Knoxville and get these scans, we'll do uh, two types of uh, imaging, or one type of imaging, but we'll generate two scans. The first one is a planar scan, and for that, you lie on the bed after you've received the radioactivity, and two cameras will go from your head to your toes and make uh, a two-dimensional picture. So essentially like a, uh, it's not a two-dimensional x-ray, but it's a, a two-dimensional image of the radioactivity throughout your entire body, and uh, there's a, this is what, a, it's called a planar scan, and this is the kind of image you get out of that. And then we'll place the cameras around your heart or close to your heart, and then they'll spin or the cameras will spin around you, and we can generate three-dimensional images um, of your heart. <clears throat> and that's the kind of image, the spec CT imaging, and we can get full three-dimensional uh, information from that. We've done <clears throat> four TTR patients right now and five of the healthies, and here's the data we're generating so far. So on the left in the blue box, you can see some healthy volunteers and this helps us understand how the peptide with the radioactivity is being cleared in somebody who doesn't have disease. So what you can see is there's no heart. I've labeled the heart, but it's that's where it should be, but you can't see anything. It's sort of gray because there's some blood pool radioactivity, but you can see the liver and you can see the kidneys because that's where the, the peptide is cleared. And then you can see the bladder because it's also going out in the urine. And that's basically what a healthy uh, subject looks like. In contrast, when you look at uh, a patient with TTR amyloidosis, the heart lights up really quite well. This is the left side of the heart. This is the right side of the heart. And then you can see the liver, the kidneys, and the bladder also. There may be some evidence of GI uptake in this patient as well. And we can image that. We can get really crisp, clear images at one hour post-injection and at three hours uh, after the injection. You'll notice as well there's absolutely no sort of uptake in the bone, which is what happens with PYP to confuse the issue. So we're really quite excited about what we might be able to see with this tracer. Once again, this is a zoom of, of two of those subjects. This is the healthy volunteer again. There's absolutely no evidence of heart uptake in the healthy volunteer, but you can see uh, really quite nicely the left side of the heart and even the, uh, the space inside the left side of the heart, the left ventricular lumen where the blood is, is, you can see that as a sort of a light patch. And then you can see the right side of the heart. This is probably the right atrium. And so the images are, are really quite nice. Of course, we can do some really uh, interesting things. Um, as a part of the study, we're actually comparing our peptide with the pyrophosphate scan uh, that Dr. Uri was talking about. It's We want to demonstrate that we can see what the PYP can see and then what benefit we could add with our radio tracer as well. So on the right-hand side, on the top row, you can see a patient. This is the heart. That horseshoe shape is the left side of the heart. And you can see the, the wall that divides the left and right side, and then the outer left side of the wall. This is all taking up the peptide indicative of amyloid. There's three different views of that. The next row in red is a PYP scan, and you can see that lights up also, but it's a lot harder to see, a little bit harder to see, but it's also positive. And then we can do some really sexy things in the lab by overlaying those things and making sure that everything is lighting up where it should, and we can generate these 
really nice 3D models of, of the heart itself, where you can actually, as it spins around, you can actually see into the left side of the heart. And so we're using all these analytical tools to compare um, the uptake of our tracer with the standard of care, which is this pyrophosphate scan or PYP scan. One of the other interesting things we've noted in one or two of our TTR patients is that we can pick up lung activity as well. And uh, <clears throat> this is a patient where you can see the heart lights up really quite strongly. Both kidneys are lighting up, that's the liver. As it spins round, you can see that shadow right behind the heart on the back wall, that's lung uptake. And on the right-hand side, you can see sort of the lung uptake uh, that's present on the, on the wall of the left lung. And uh, <clears throat> so again, we're learning about this tracer with every patient who comes to Knoxville to get a scan. We know the heart should be involved. That's part of the recruitment process. So can we see the heart? But what else can we see? What other benefit can we add in an imaging, in an image that can help the physicians understand the disease uh, and, and make recommendations? So we think we, we might be able to see lung uh, as well with this agent. So it's, that's quite exciting. So with our early observations, as I mentioned, we've only done uh, <clears throat> five TTR patients, four with diagnosis and one with PYP negative. We know that the peptide uh, does not bind healthy hearts that don't have amyloid in them, which is great. That's the first step. Um, we also know now, I think, that the, the peptide can detect TTR amyloid in the heart. And we haven't recruited any AL patients, but we'll work on that as well. Uh, it, we think the peptide might also be able to detect amyloid in the lung. But then we also want to detect, uh, we also want to recruit patients after this initial pilot, sort of expand the study where we can get patients with interesting and other sites of deposition. Uh, it was just mentioned about laryngeal deposition. That's that's not common in uh, systemic amyloidosis, but it is a known phenomenon that might be imageable with this agent. So see what else we can actually see. So this is a pilot study and we hope to expand it uh, and enhance enrollment and open enrollment to a much larger group uh, to really assess this, uh, this reagent. And with that, I wanna thank uh, Muriel for the invitation and everybody who works with me. Uh, to do this. And I would like to also echo, doc, echo Dr. Erie's words about uh, the importance of patients in the role of developing these new therapies for, for TTR and uh, all the other forms of amyloidosis and these diagnoses. We couldn't do it without you guys and your involvement and your support and your enthusiasm. And I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Muriel. Oh, thank you, Dr. Wall. I have a couple of quickie questions. You you mentioned Breyer and the uh... The, the the larynx would 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 if she's interested in getting scanned to see if it is in her larynx would that be something that you would invite her to come to Tennessee and do that? If she has a cut, if she if she meets the inclusion and exclusion criteria, so mostly having diagnosis of cardiac amyloid, TTR amyloid, um, and you know meets the health healthy heart and and liver requirements, absolutely. So there's a number, I'm not sure if you can still see my screen, there's not a number, there's an email address at the bottom of this slide, uh, emartin at utmc.edu, you have that email, uh, Muriel. Anyone who's interested uh, in talking to us or come in thinking about involved, being involved in this study, please drop Emily a, an email and she'll get back to you. She's way more efficient at answering emails than I am. And tell me, do you buy these people uh, dinner? Do you put them up in a hotel? Do you pay for anything? <laughs> do they have to be independently wealthy to fly to Knoxville? No, no, we have support, thankfully, from Nord um, through a trialist. Nord will help tra with travel expenses. We put them up in the hotel. And from the moment the patient arrives and every minute there at the hospital, I spend every second with them. And so you get to hang out with me and listen to me pontificate and ask it. We just hang out and have a chat. Wow, Dinner's it's worth normal. the trip. Oh, yeah, just for that, actually, just for that. And and do you feed these people too? Um, the dinner is, the food is paid for by Nord. Uh, I don't, I'm being an introvert. I don't normally go out for dinner with anyone, but um, I, I will, I'm there with them all the time, yes. Okay, okay great. Thank you so much. And, and, and did you, we you brought up this trial two weeks ago at our AL webinar. Did you get any recruitees from that? We have we have a we have six yeah AL patients we're about screening, um, and we're hoping to get three of them in. Yes, thank you very much for that. But you have, again, you have such rigid requirements for this 
Well, it, they're not our requirements. They were the FDA's requirements, and um, they were put they were put in place for the to safeguard the patients. And once we get enough data, we can loosen up the requirements for recruitment. And the idea is that anybody who would like a scan who meets the um, the diagnostic criteria, you have a diagnosis of amyloidosis, would be able to get a scan, and that will allow us to assess the the, the big population. And so we're working we're working our way towards that, but it's it's the initial step. Thank you. We'll we'll have some Q and A after we hear from the rest of our farmers. Thank you so much. And. Thank you so much. That's very exciting. We hear all the time uh, from patients who were diagnosed, you know, they, they know they carry the carry the, the gene because of a DNA test, yet they're not symptomatic and they're kind of waiting for the shoe to drop. So this trial will will help those people in feeling they're doing something positive rather than just waiting for that shoe to drop. I know a lot of doctors right now are, are prescribing diflunazole for their patients that are diagnosed. And, uh, and and so this is really exciting that you're doing that. Uh, Dr. Yuri, I, when, when I noticed that um, when 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 Hannah Pope mentioned the fact that at the on the acaramidus trial, there was a time because there was a standard of care being tefamidus, there were might have been some patients that were both on tefamidus and acaramidus at the same time. So uh, Acaramidus trial, the the tefamidus use or exposure was allowed at 12 months after the trial. So up front, they weren't on it. Um, if you do some of the analysis and look at the impact of tefamidus, it did look to be uh, used in clinical worsening in the, in the placebo arm or so. Um, but yeah, there was dual use, but that's because as uh, has been pointed out, I think by Dr. Karam, there's a standard of care, so it would be unethical not to allow exposure to a therapy that works. Uh, but the first year is without, acaramidus and tefamidus were not used together in the trial. Interesting, gotcha, okay. We do have one question, though, that, that I'd like to ask all of our clinical trial people. Uh, probably if we went to clinicaltrials.gov, we would see the answer to this. But since you're all here, um, if a person is on a pacemaker, are, are, would they be disqualified from your clinical trials? So what is the answer to that? Okay. Dr. Wall. Uh, they are not excluded from our trial. There's, you would be excluded from a study with an MRI, but we don't use MRI. Okay. All right. Let's do it differently. Does anyone exclude people with a pacemaker from their trial? If you do, speak now. All right. So there you have it. Uh, if you have a pacemaker, you doesn't look like you're excluded from quite a few trials. There might be some you are excluded from, but if you check clinicaltrials.gov, the exclusion criteria is usually pretty clear on those matters. So I want to thank everyone. Um, I especially want to thank Dr. Yuri and Dr. Karam for giving up, you know, their Saturdays. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for giving up your Saturdays to be with our patients. You're, you're all wonderful, and we appreciate it so much. And Pharma, we know that you won't don't want us to, sh to record your videos for future use, and we'll be very good about that, unless you tell us specifically we can. And um, otherwise, uh, we, will, we will have this recording up in another couple of weeks for everyone to view. And we want to thank everyone for giving us their Saturday. And thank you, and have a beautiful day. And remember to spring ahead on your clocks today. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Muriel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Muriel. Bye-bye, everyone.